super excited to be here to talk about this idea and reframe the question a little bit. Um, and I'm going to argue that the pain point in surgery today is not at the tip of the blade. In fact, it's elsewhere. And that we, I'm going to try to make a case for something called a mobility as a vital sign. So I want to make this real for you. You've been hearing about all these technologies like 3D printing, bi-models and instruments and devices, but let's bring it down to an actual patient, something that we can take care of and I do now. There's a patient who has been stuck in a wheelchair for 10 years. Six years ago, 30 years ago, he had the hip put in, it failed, but over time, he's been told that this surgery couldn't be fixed, his bone was too weak, and the operation would be too dangerous. But fast forward to today, we were able to create a 3D model of his pelvis, which allowed me to know exactly where the anatomy was, make a relatively small incision, create a 3D printed titanium model with a special surface on the back, and each of those holes is designed to put a screw into bone that can withstand the forces we're applying to it, and that operation could not have been done before this, this, this technology is available, and there is the final artifact of what happens. So this is making the technology real. This is actually changing the way we do surgery. However, it is not a common operation. To that point, the bulk of the surgery we do today, we know how to do it. We don't need AI, chat GPT-12 to make that happen for us. What we need to solve in the next three to five years are questions of access to surgery and perioperative care, quality through reproducibility and variance in outcomes, and cost. Those are the big issues. And I'm going to focus today on this issue of the perioperative journey, which today for most people starts where? In the doctor's office. But actually, let's rethink the whole patient journey. I'm going to take you through a fast Daniel Craft style slide deck. OK, here we go. It starts in, in the digital space where people are now currently already doing the bulk of their medical decision making starts. Um, it may wind up in a Walgreens where patients are not being seen at off hours when they actually have time to see the doctor. It may be uh, continue off in a kiosk, which is enabled with sensors and a telemedicine physician, and it may go on to a telehealth platform like this, but instead of interfacing with their physician, they may be interfacing instead with a digital human. Now, um, going back to the clinic, the patient now needs a physical exam prior to surgery. There's a camera in the room that's monitoring the exam and backfilling the electronic health record along with the voice uh, transcription software. The physician is making decisions based on an AI that's supporting him by also reminding him of things like simple things like order sets, preventative care reminders, but as we get further along, things like patient-specific recommendations, potentially even diagnostic support, and certainly coding support. Moving on to the risk of that operation will be defined through, uh, through data collected and tracked over hundreds of thousands of lives to really get a really good sense of what this particular patient is going up with against risk. And that surgery, instead of bringing the patient to the hospital, may actually wind up being bringing the hospital to the patient. And people are now talking about mobile operating rooms that can be brought into a community, the surgery can be performed, and then the patient can actually stay home. The surgeon will have been trained, very likely, on some kind of virtual reality platform. More interestingly, if they've not done this procedure in a while, they may be being recertified before they get a chance to do it again. The, patient, the surgeon, if there's an orthopedic surgeon, may use holograms to review the anatomy, um, which is really cool stuff, and at the same time, and very interestingly, the hardware he's putting into the patient, instead of being made in a distant place by a company, they may have licensed the design of that device, the hospital may have become a certified 3D uh, printing um, place, and they may actually have the device made in-house. In the recovery room today, Alexa will provide you a nursing genie that will answer all the simple questions, freeing up the nurse to take care of other problems, like making sure your line's working. And at the same time, when you get home, you'll actually have the opportunity to open up that box that was delivered, inside which there are all the sensors that allow you to create, essentially, your recovery room at home. The patient engagement platform that was emailed to you, been using all this time, will collect the data from you, will send it back to the hospital, theoretically, virtually, and allow you to set up the, patient, the, the physical therapy recovery program that takes you through the surgery. 
when that causes pain, you'll call in your drone for your medication delivery. As you may know, Amazon actually has FAA approval to, to fly all these drones as an airline at this point. So, the argument is made that the future is here. I would argue that it's true that it's not evenly distributed, but what really is the problem is that it's actually not linked. We've had a lot of discussions so far about platforms and how they should connect divergent disease-modifying platforms like congestive heart failure and diabetes, for example, but those are across the horizontal healthcare. We've been looking at a specific disease process and a vertical integration. What can that look like? So I'm going to show you something that illustrates what I call confluence, which is not the same as convergence. Confluence is when, let's say, two rivers come together, each with their own ecosystem, but when the two rivers come together and create a larger ecosystem that wasn't plausible for either river alone. Now you get into experiences that were not previously possible, and that is where the magic is going to happen. So I'm going to show you this video, and this is where I try to make that real for you. You get a chance to see what it would look like if, in fact, we were able to connect all this digital infrastructure in a vertical experience that is connected and flawless with, for this patient. And I, this is the one, there's a little audio on it. Hello, oh, this is Sol, Dr. Beanie's assistant. Hello, Sol. This is Tyler. I wanted to ask you about my recent surgery. Hey, Tyler. I see that you had a total knee replacement five days ago with Dr. Beanie. I have access to your records and can help you with any questions you may have. Thank you, Sol. First, I don't remember what they found at surgery. You know, I was a little out of it. No worries. I just read your operative report and reviewed the visual records from the operating room. You had exposed bone on both sides of the joint and a torn meniscus. These are both considered excellent indications for surgery, so you can expect very good resolution of your symptoms. <laughs> That's great. The live XR was kind of cool. So, I'm glad it was correct. Also, the drone delivery with my medications arrived just as I got home, but I can't remember which pills to take or when. Can you tell me? Yes, of course. The discharge summary states that you should take the pain medicine about 20 minutes before you put on your headset for your virtual reality meditation therapy. And my leg, it's uh, a little swollen as well. Should I be concerned? First, let's run a thermal scan. You have my permission. Thank you. Voice print activation enabled. According to the scan, the skin surface temperature and tensile grade is not suggestive of any complication of a clot in your leg. Okay, well, that's super helpful, Soul. I feel much better. Yes, I can see and hear that. Your anxiety measures dropped seven points. <laughs> that's so cool how you can just see that. Uh, what else did you find? You were a little behind on your knee flexion goals compared to other people your age and gender at this time in their recovery. You only achieved 100 degrees of knee flexion and are not putting enough weight on your operated leg. Well, what do you think I should do about that? I will send your results to Dr. Beanie's office as you might benefit from in-person physical therapy. I can arrange an automated insurance approval for the treatment. Okay, well that makes sense. You have my permission. In the meantime, what should I do for exercise? Voice print activation enabled. I sent the referral request and it was approved. We can review the exercises you should be doing and, if you can put on your rehab sensor shoes, I can help verbally guide your exercises. Well, I like the idea, Soul, but... Can we do it a little later? Of course. I'll reach out at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs> You're kidding me, right? I'm supposed to be resting, remember? Okay, fine. How does 9 o'clock sound? That's much better. Great. I scanned your home and see that you have a connected coffee maker. I'll set coffee to brew at 8.45. Well, thank you. Right? Who doesn't want that? Raise your hand if you don't want that. You don't want that? I cannot see a reason why connecting all those technologies into a string of interdependent software platforms that speak to each other, collect information, give you the right answer, and support your recovery whenever you want, whenever you want, isn't going to be the move forward, the technological direction that we need to go to make it all make sense. At the same time, there's another big driver, which is the incredible cost of healthcare. And we need to prove that the work we're doing is actually helping to either improve the quality of care we deliver or at the very least decrease the cost. 
And I would argue that in the world of healthcare, the primary goal, goal of all healthcare is actually to keep us moving. Whether you're dealing with depression, obesity, heart disease, lung disease, you name it. At the end of the day, it's about keeping us moving within the world we live in. And even if you choose to be sedentary, at least you should have the option of moving because you're healthy. And yet, even though one-fifth of the GDP of the United States is devoted to ensuring that we're so theoretically healthy, it does not take mobility into account. So I'm going to posit this question. If the goal of all healthcare is to restore, maintain, or improve mobility, then the success of any intervention should be measured in terms of its impact on our global mobility, or individual mobility, or collective mobility, but somehow measured in terms of mobility. Now here's the problem. It's not a vital sign. We don't have it. We actually don't even agree on a measure of mobility. We do for cars, and I take inspiration here, we call it miles to the gallon. Now, if we use mobility as a vital sign, it has to be a simple formula. It can't be too complicated. It has to be a measure of kinematics and kinetics which is how your body moves in space, that would be the miles, and a measure of metabolic activity to go with it, how much energy is required to move, that would be the gallons, so hence miles to the gallon, and of course, it has to be personalized. You don't want to be measured against an average, you want to be measured someone that looks like you. And it has to have some simple rules. It has to be cheap, it has to be easy, it has to be familiar. A lot of people have failed here because they're trying to create new numbers, new variables no one's comfortable with, and we chose date, gate lab variables because we've been working with them for 40 years. You've got to make it continuous, and you've got to make it real. We're talking about real-world data, which we've never had before. So a couple of years ago, we paired up with Google. So my lab at UCSF and Google got together, and we created a hypothesis that machine learning algorithms could use data from inertial motion sensors to replicate gate lab outputs. And I just want to acknowledge the rest of my team on this project. And to make a long story short, we took all that very complex information that you see at the top coming off a gyroscope and accelerometer, and actually was able to train an algorithm to output something called knee angular velocity. It may not be familiar to you, but anybody working in motion understands the importance of this particular variable. And what that allowed us to do is to create five motion biomarkers which are not step count, they're not the length of your stride. These are the measures that we can use to actually recreate knee motion very, very effectively. It's knee extension moment, knee angular velocity, vertical ground reaction force, hip flexion angle, knee angular excursion. So we created an AI model that we plan to make public, along with the data set that was used to train it, with the idea of creating an under, under, underpinning of the data set required to fundly, fundament, fundamentally measure motion as a vital sign at least the kinetic part, the kinematic part. Now, that's amazing, because if we can now do that, this idea of mobility as a vital sign, which is not new, it's been around for some time, now becomes accessible to us. We can actually start thinking about possibly, maybe, getting to the point where we actually can start having a measure like miles to the gallon, against which we can measure all our endeavors in healthcare. Wouldn't that be amazing? Because now you can start qualifying and quantifying where the dollars go and the impact they have on the outcome we all want, which is maintaining mobility. And it's real time, continuous, and from the real world, not some lab. But there was one more thing. And the one more thing was that as we were working on this, I realized that even if we make this publicly available and all the data accessible to everyone, the problem was two steps back with the sensors. If people were not, if the hardware was not putting out a data stream that was success, that, that could be used by the algorithm, then we were going to have gibberish. So we're now starting to move forward to this idea with the CTA. We haven't quite signed it yet, but we're probably going to do it together. It's to create a standards around motion sensors. The motion sensor mobility standards is sort of my pitch to all of you. Any of you wants to get on board, we've got Samsung, we've got big companies like that helping us. This idea is if we can agree on the quality of the, of the hardware, then we can start collecting these data points across in a way that's like hardware agnostic. Um, so 
What I told you is just the kinematic and kinetics part. I think we solved that part of the equation. The, the second one, a measure metabolic activity, that's going to be basically from your heart rate variability on your, on your watch. So we have access to that. The last piece is going to be agreeing on how to do that so we can get enough of a normative data set that we can personalize the outcome. And at that point, I think I'll be able to show you some future date, a video of the impact it could have to be able to create a single measure that we can all agree on that could potentially measure the value of our investments in healthcare. With that, I invite you to consider joining us at the Digital Orthopedics Conference San Francisco. It's May 3rd through 5th this year. We're fo focusing on the digital transformation of outpatient surgery. It draws an awfully incredible crowd of people, and uh, I want to thank you for your attention, and, and uh, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Stefano, just one quick question for me. Um, rehabilitation for orthopedics yes. has become very digital, theoretically. What can we expect in the future for patients, for example, have knee replacement, hip replacements to be remotely managed for rehabilitation? What have you seen happening at the moment? Um, we're, huh, it's a good question. We're seeing a lot of people trying to understand exactly how much rehabilitation works. So uh, some of my own work with re sensors, it's an interesting topic, I'll take a second. I put a bunch of sensors on a whole lot of people and we tracked them. We found the, the people who did the least amount of exercise in the first month after surgery had the best outcomes <laughs> two months after surgery. So we, it, it's also this measuring these things allows us to challenge assumptions of the best way to deal with these uh, with, with the, with, and deploy technology as well. So yes, we will see access to physical therapy, especially where people don't have normative access. If they're a long way from home, a long way from a physical oh. therapist. Say. What about yes. VR rehabilitation? Do you think that's coming in? Yes, I do. Actually, uh, if you, did you get a chance to try out there? Yeah, that's very, very good. I think there's definitely an opportunity there. Wonderful. Doc SF, do go if you can. I went there a few years ago. Yes. I spoke there. It was it's amazing. an amazing conference, really good experience. So please, right. thank you so much, Stefano. Thank you.